we've been sort of led to believe that religion is arbitrary. You can change your religion like you can change your socks. You know, just spin the wheel and pick one. We have a veritable smorgasbord of religions. And they all must be respected. Especially the most harmful ones that bring the most detriment and, dis and destruction into our midst. Especially over in Europe and the UK. That you must get in line and you must respect the this other religion and in criticizing it at all is racist somehow and you know if you see a religion perpetrating um vile things in our midst then it just must be accepted tolerance is the new religion tolerance is the new universal clearly there's stuff going on in rome clearly this has has a lot to do with Rome and the transformation of Rome. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized that it actually goes b back further than that. I was looking at history and I noticed that some of these patterns that we're actually still seeing today pre even predate the origins of Christianity and whatever, whatever. Like, um, for instance, I noticed... I noticed that the word liberal obviously we talk about that now um it's used in a negative context in america more than in europe where in europe being a liberal society is still something that um is is heavily celebrated but if you look at the french revolution like liberty looms large there too but I happen to notice this, and, you know, somebody might call it arbitrary. But the thing is, when you start to see patterns occurring over and over and over again, at some point, at some point, it, it just becomes silly and dismissive to um, argue that these patterns aren't there. Noticed yet. But I did notice, you know, it's in, it's, it, it features large in the American Revolution, you know, give me liberty or give me death, and the tree of liberty being watered by the blood of revolutions. I, I was actually looking for possible pagan origins of St. Patrick's Day this year, and I came across this Liber Potter, the Free Father. His festival was Liberalia, celebrated on March 17th, which is the same date that St. Patrick's Day is celebrated on. And it's interesting because Potter, obviously, is in the same root, is in the name Patrick. It became like a drunken holiday, which obviously St. Patrick's Day has been known for as well. And it also celebrates the overturning of the old order with, to bring in the new order. Now, this obviously predates Christianism. This is a pagan deity. But it's utilized for the same function. So Patrick is supposed to celebrate the overturning of the indigenous pagan worldview for the Christian one. While Liber Pater is associated with the overthrow of the old Roman kingdom and the celebrating of the Roman Republic. There's a lot of focus on um, the changeover from the Roman Republic to the Roman um, Empire. But there's very, very little discussion about the fact that Rome was actually a kingdom, like in the old-fashioned style, prior to this. And it was actually a revolution that overturned the kingdom and made it um, a republic. And what's very interesting is this is the same kind of thing that happened in France, in America, I mean, we're talking, what, like 1,200 or no, more than that. Like, I don't know, like millennia, millennia. I mean, we're talking the B.C. era right now. It's strange that these parallels can be found in history going back that long. A, a god was, like, created to become the patron deity of Rome's plebeians, well, it's interesting because the liberty of the French Revolution um, and the American Revolution was also about 
supposedly the rights of the common man against the tyranny of our overlords. But this is one way to foment social change, social engineering. If all you have to do is appeal to the commoners because they outnumber um, they outnumber those at the top. And if you can appeal to them and, and use manipulation, psychological manipulation, and tell them, I am here to liberate you. I am here to make you free. And then uh, demonize the current paradigm. Then you can foment a shift. We're in the throes of this right now. But this has been done multiple times in history. <laughs> also, he was a phallic deity. At this point in time, they have not established monothought yet. And so we would have had male and female fertility imagery throughout, uh, throughout our indigenous worldview as Europeans. But it, it, it does seem that they use this phallic deity in conjunction with their appealing to the plebeians to foment an uprising and social shift. So it does seem like there are these tactics that have been around for a while. Um, because it looks like there there had been Libera, who was a female equivalent to him. The phallus deity was emphasized. Because you need men in order to actualize a revolution. That clued me into this axial age which is going back in time even more, the 8th to the 3rd century BCE. A lot happened in late Rome. And then between like the 2nd to the 5th centuries, a lot is happening. And then you've got basically like the 5th to the 8th century is this area of like domination and takeover by a foreign entity, which has been hidden from our knowledge. All all of the records go missing in that era. That's the epicenter of where Europe was taken over by a foreign entity, which destroyed our ruling classes. It's, it's still in place to this day. But the Axial Age is very, very interesting because this is where all the great religions, supposedly, of the world begin. And so we're looking at patterns. We're looking at um, we're looking at where things come into be. And what you find is in history you have these hot spots, and these hot spots generally have um, a lot of activity going on. It's sort of just like this epicenter where all of these all of this religious activity occurred like right at the same time. But what else happened during that axial age? A new level of consciousness evolved in 550 BCE. Anthropologists and human evolutionary scientists would tell you that as a species, in, in terms of our evolutionary development, that we're not any different than humans um, were at this period of time as in, in terms of like, our cranial capacity and the evolution of our brains. What happened to make us think differently? Are we Homo sapiens the same as we were in ancient times? Or are there vast differences between our psychology today and our ancient ancestors? Ancient people of 3,000 years ago knew far less than we do today about medicine, biology, and the solar system, and probably much more about such subjects as how to identify an ant edible plants, defend themselves from animals, and relate to their societies. <clears throat> Before a certain time, some psychologists believed ancient peoples also differed from us by exhibiting far less capacity to monitor their internal thoughts, feelings, and motives. They engaged in little or no self-reflection, and lacked a personal identity other than a name, parentage, and recollection of a sequence of life events. It's important to note that us barbarians in the North, we didn't really experience this same shift. This is inherently like a Middle Eastern and I would, I would say Near East and Orientalist shift in a way. 
connected to trade routes. The German philosopher Karl Jaspers wrote, A strange veil seems to lie over most ancient cultures as though man had not really come into himself. Well, I mean, I would argue that maybe it's the opposite of that. Maybe the strange veil is what's over our eyes now. Below is a horizontal timeline extending from 2000 BCE to 2000 CE today. Crossing it vertically is an axis of change positioned at 550 BCE. This axis, according to Jaff, Jaspers, divided earlier peoples from those who more closely resemble the peoples of today. Um, that axis is an era from about 800 BCE to 200 BCE, designated as the Axial Age or the Great Transformation. I mean, it seems like if, if the entire humanity's psychology changed, you'd think this would be something that people are talking about more often there we have it now in the grand scheme of things in the grand scheme of history when we're talking going back hundreds of thousands of years this shift is not actually that far off from year zero 2000 bce to 2000 ce well 500 bce is not that far off the thing is, for Northern Europeans, it's just that we start to become more drastically affected by this during our takeover, which sort of epicenters right around 500 CE with uh, the Franks, who were not... <laughs> I don't... It's like you keep saying this word. I don't think it means what you think it means. The Franks. I don't think that the ruling family that would come to dominate Europe uh, I think that they embedded themselves in Frankish society and were passing as Franks I don't think they were actually Franks <laughs> in terms I think they used the Franks um, as military might people who lived on the early side of the axis so prior to 550 BCE some scholars believed lacked much self-reflection and lacked the concept, ideas, and thoughts related to self-awareness. People who lived on the latter side of the axis were essentially contemporary in those aspects of their psychology. People who lived in a post-axial age environment were actually much more modern than you think. Like, we would be able to rate, relate to them on a psychological level. Um better than people who lived prior to this. Because prior to this, we were still living in a more natural state of being the human animal. This all goes back to what I've been talking about with the ethnos and um, our natural way of being. The human animal exists in the ethnos. Now you might say that, oh, self-awareness and um, thinking about yourself as an individual um, that that's an advancement for humanity. Well, that's also because we're brainwashed to think that this is a good thing. But what this does is it's like it takes us out of our tribe. Northern Europeans, we're still functioning in this older mindset all the way up until the Franks, echo, 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 <laughs> usurped a Germanic society and overran us, conquered us, um, enslaved us. I mean, you even have with the Anglo-Saxons, when the Normans came, here's a hint for you. Vikings don't speak French. So when you hear historians just trying to pass off the Normans as just a continuation of Vikings, they're just going to do what Vikings do. Well, this is, um, this is more trickery. It's intended to pass the buck on someone else, obscure who's really behind the scenes. Ideology is used to change, to shift thought, and thought drives social engineering.
And so Northern Europeans were not functioning, I argue, under what you see in this Axial Age thought until, until far later. But before the Axial Transformation, human beings told one another myths and other stories about how they came to be. The stories were not regarded as true or false. false. Rather, their truth did not require questioning. Well... <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, but this was part of the epiphany that I had. This whole, like, debate me, bro. Debate me. What's true and what's not true. Let, let's hash this out. This is part of this shift in your mind. Like, there are certain things that are not true or false. Like, they just are. So it's like when you get these Christians who look at you and they're like, what happens when you die? It's like you must have an answer for all things. And it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about, like, a an Abrahamic worldview or an like this overly rationalist scientific worldview, the impetus to view the world in this way goes right back to this era that they're talking about and then is eventually encoded and enshrined in various religions. And again, the Protestant Reformation did the same thing that the Lieber Pater thing did because it played to the common man without having any conscious awareness that you're just being used to foment social change. At every major change in um, religious regime, regime changed also went along with an economic shift. Oh, transcendence. Who's been talking about that a great deal? So it does, it does, it does all go back to the Silk Road. And so... If you look at a map, the places where these religious advancements all took place were all places that were connected on the Silk Road. They don't even include Northern European indigenous belief as a world religion. They, when they talk about world religions, and you look up images, what do you have here? You have just all um, symbols, but, the, but Northern Europe is not even represented at all. Neither are like the tribal peoples of, of Sib Siberia or like Mongolia. And so when you look at the Silk Road trade routes, like all of these world religions, every single, but every single one of these religions features prominently on the Silk Road route. And anybody who is not on this route doesn't have the honor or the respect even of being recognized as a religion. Um, but then you've got, you know, then, then you've got the Greek Empire expanding all of the activity with um, Alexander the Great comes like right after the Axial Age. And then finally they connect over to China. So uh, you can you can call this a coincidence all you want, but the fact of the matter is that ideology influences thought, and thought influences action. And it seems clear to me that prior to this axial age, we thought differently. So they're telling us that we were not we were not self reflective and not even fully conscious we did not even have a fully conscious self-understanding that's what they're telling us this idea that your ancestry came from your name and your parentage was still in full force in northern europe all the way until christianization and even you, you what you have is you have sort of like lukewarm in between stages where certain germanic tribes had like a halfway halfway christian but not really so they were they were christian in name only essentially because they were still practicing their tribal worldview their tribal um society and kinship was crucially, crucially important. Without a lineage, without a pedigree, you were nothing. Not only that, but you would be highly suspect. So this was all still in, in place in Northern Europe. Even under supposedly Christian Anglo-Saxon England. And the first thing that William the Conqueror did when he took over 
is he brought in a banking community from France. These were not Vikings. Vikings were not bankers. And the first thing they did was consolidate all the land, um, destroy the, the ruling class, which was kinship tribal based, kill off all the leadership, um, kick peasants off the land. They engaged in a massive genocide in the harrying of the Norse. They consolidated all the land, put where you would have had like a thousand um, regional lords under the Anglo-Saxon system. Then they consolidate that to just a few hundred. All the communal land holdings, got, they got rid of them. And essentially, the Anglo-Saxons were enslaved. So arguably, we were still living in a pre-Axial Age model of thinking in Northern Europe, you know, a thousand years after the fact. Animism is the only real religion. Well, I am making the argument that it makes perfect sense to me <laughs> that if you wanted to um, facilitate social change that the best way to do that is to facilitate a shift, a paradigm shift. A lot of talk in, in the modern right wing about this emphasis on individualism, that liberal individualism. Well, this isn't new. Apparently this goes back to the axial age, but that's also where you get these universalist religions. So you didn't really have any prophets before that. I mean, it's a, it is almost like um, an oxymoron. It's, it's another one of these inversions because they're telling us that this is the origin of the individual and self-awareness. But they're telling us that. But when we look at it, we see that, oh, if you're not, if you're not um, adhering to this universalist thought, well, then you're subjected to genocide. I mean, this, this is outlined in um, the, the Hebrew part of the Bible, too, well before Christianity came around. But I would just go back to sort of the natural way of being <laughs> for all people. And, I mean, this isn't, this isn't actually something that originated only with, you know, my own mind. I'm not a prophet or a psychic, and I don't channel... Well, I do channel. I do, but I channel in the way that every single one of us can channel when we're when we become aligned with our blood memory and our ancestral way of being. And so, it, it's something that is um, it's supported by anthropology. It's supported by looking at animistic tribal religions all throughout the world today, and it does go back to the discussions on the ethnos. This universalist uh, monothink was much more strongly found in the Near East, which was considered Oriental. And so the ancient Greeks used ethnos to describe living organisms that are gathered together like with like, that which is alike unto itself. So they, they would just as equally refer to a human tribal group as an ethnos as they would to a hive of bees or a flock of birds as an ethnos. The point was being related to one another. And a tribe or a clan was just an extended kinship group. It, it, this is what I've been referring to as folk faith, but it really does just come back to animism, ancestor and nature veneration. And it seems that I mean, there are reasons to organize it to a greater degree, especially for solidifying your tribe for survival against invasions and incursions from outside tribes. You do want to solidify this sense of community. You do want um, a pantheon of greater gods that all of us can rally around. But in your day-to-day -day life, you, the whites and the spirits of the land, of nature, and your own ancestors were first and foremost the predominant spiritual reality for you. And the same thing can be said whether you are you were a Germanic tribesman, a Celtic clansman, 
um, a uh, a Mongolian <laughs> uh, herder, you know, or a Polynesian islander. It, it really doesn't matter. All around the world, human beings in their natural state of being had this world view. And if left unto our own devices, we would naturally revert to this because it's the natural way of being. Every single other religion is a construct. Because as long as they come from a, a, you know, a, a prophet who is revealing something, well, then that individual is constructing it. So it's a flipping psyop. <laughs> That's what it is. It's you're buying into a cult leader's um, worldview. As time goes on and the more I research and the more I look into things, the more I find that this trail that I'm on is correct. It is accurate. It is true. And the idea that you can spin the wheel and pick a religion has never, ever been something that has been the case in society ever. And it, it, de it definitely goes along with empire um, and economy and trade routes. And we can see this playing out right now. If you pay attention to what's in the news, everybody's all up in arms about Donald Trump and trade deals. And the reason Brexit has been sitting on ice for three years and hasn't happened is, is specifically down to trade deals. So as much as we think, or at least I think, economics is boring and uninteresting, um, it is part of the reality that we have and um it's it's defining um it's defining the movements of the world on a geopolitical scale now just as much as it ever was but now we're in this other it's like Lieber Potter is back again to foment another overturning of our reality so I don't think it's a coincidence that we now have this multi multiplicity of religions Presented at the same time, they're trying to feed us a multi multiplicity of ethno-cultural society. Because if they can get us used to... It's it's like the new tribe and the new religion is this religion of tolerance. Like it, It's like the final throw in this complete breakdown of ethnic identity. Because the new identity... I mean, it's another shift. It's another axial shift. Because the new identity is the identity that the state gives you. It's not only is it no longer related to par parentage and um, tribe and ethnicity and, you know, from whom you descend. Nope, that's out the window. But it's also not in your race. It's not in your religion. What is your identity now? What is it? Which brand of sneakers that you choose to wear? Is it the car that you drive? Is it which video game you waste your life absorbed in? You know, and and then we're distracted by the movements at the big scale, at the large scale, because we just sit here and bicker about our identity. Are, are you this camp or that camp? Are you this religion or that religion? Are you, you know, a liberal or are you an are you alt right? And look at how you've all seen it here. I criticize the alt-right and people lose their minds. I mean, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. People are being manipulated to think of the alt-right like as if it's their religion and their tribe. This is all part of the plan. It's chaos. It's confusion. Choose an identity any identity we don't really care as long as it's not your tribe if you choose your ethnic tribe as your identity we're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks because if we had animism we might have people respecting the planet once again we might have people respecting animals once again and if we respected the planet and animals well how could the powers that be rape the earth so catastrophically we can't even speak openly anymore so i don't think that um religious infighting is even a thing at all i think if your religion 
is anything other than rooted in the natural world with reverence for your ancestors and is synonymous with your ethnic tribal identity, then you're hived in to a contrived system of thought control. And social engineering is directly related to these economic shifts. I don't think that these universalist religions, that these, all of these revealed religions with the prophets that just came, resulting in an entire shift of human consciousness that facilitates the Silk Road and trade routes and the rise of empire as we know it. So I don't think it's paranoid or delusional in any way, shape, or form to think that they would not be doing it right now. For us to think that games could be played in the past, but they're not being played now, is very naive. They're 100% controlled opposition. There's absolutely no difference in uh, Antifa and the alt-right. They're the same. They're 100% the same. And the ideas and the ideology pushed by the alt-right seem to be exactly the same as the ideologies pushed by these prophets who were purveyors of revealed religion. If, if they're promoting gender warfare, if they're prom promoting Christianity, if they're promoting unity between pagans and Christians, they're operatives. The insertion of Abrahamic thought patterns into modern paganism is something that's happening by the Norna society right now. And it, it was also done by their um, he, their hero, Victor Rydberg, was doing the same thing. Victor Rydberg was 100% an operative. He was employed by a far left, basically Antifa magazine of his day. And he was involved in supporting the 1848 communist revolutions around Europe. When those revolutions failed to kick off and failed to push the, the directive, he, he took a trip to Rome and came back with new orders. Mark Purrier started saying that Carolyn was saying that Dave Martell was an agent of the Vatican. The thought never crossed my mind that the Vatican even had agents. But Victor Rydberg went to Rome and came back transformed with, with new directions and a new persona. Dave Martell started out as one of these MAGA guys. Comes All of a sudden has a new persona and he's linked up with Mark the Evangelist who's inserting Abrahamic thought patterns into Norse myth. I mean, this is probably the tip of the iceberg. If they could be moving in pagan circles, and they even fooled me, because I wasn't looking that closely, and I was as naive as the rest of you. You, you, you don't expect, because you think if someone is telling us that they're on our team, that they really are on our team. When the whole entire society was identifying themselves under the label of Christian after generations and generations and generations of having no other option. Along comes a figure who's like, I'm a Christian too, guys. I'm a Christian too. I'm just like you. And so the thought never crosses your mind that they could be something other than what they say. And then especially when they manufacture the resistance and they insert a lot of truth they insert a lot of reality into it it's exactly like the protestants where they're pointing at the catholic church they're pointing at the injustice the corruption um you know the too much power and how the power has been used against the little guy and your average guy in the street looks at that and is like 100 percent, they're right they're right but what your average person is not privy to is the machinations behind the scenes and how they're mixing the truth with programming that's working for something bigger than we can see on the ground. So all you have to really do is look at this axial age and realize that they, they shifted the entire reality of of society, of civilization as we know it. Another thing to look at is the suppression of the belief in um, reincarnation. 
this is not one of these arbitrary things where it's like spin the wheel, make a choice. What do you believe or what do you not believe? This also goes along with with animism because everyone everyone in their natural state of being all around the world also believed in reincarnation throughout the entire world in their natural state of being when they lived in harmony with nature under animism animistic polytheism rooted in ancestor veneration what would be the impetus to break us from that understanding well again it goes along with the facilitation of empire because this is this coincides with the transformation. It's only about 200 years after the transformation, or 250 years, 300 years or so, between the transformation of Rome from a republic to an empire, and then the outward expansion of Rome as empire under the guise of Christianity. If you're working outside of outside of human lifetimes, and everybody has access to this understanding. Well, then people are going to see what you're up to. So what happens is they restrict the understanding of reincarnation for Christians. And they stomp this out of our memory. But if you look into it, it turns out that the Kabbalists still believed in reincarnation. You do have to wonder. Like, we, we know for a fact that Kabbalah became trendy and among the rich and powerful like in hollywood you have to wonder if if kabbalists retained an understanding of re and then you look into the repression of the understanding of reincarnation coinciding with the spread of the you know the transformed um Roman Empire under the guise of Christendom, which coincides with trade routes and the banking industry. Why are we being cut off from this? Especially because back then you didn't have the internet. You didn't have a local library even. You didn't even have like the Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, you didn't have a dictionary. You didn't have the ability to go out and look up information. Anyway, Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the support. Be more skeptical. That, that's all I can really close this out with. Be more skeptical. Um, be aware that thought bubbles, the creation of thought bubbles is nothing new. Like your salty old grandpa who said all religions are fake. They're just created for mind control. That's true. It's true. We have a natural state of being that is one with nature that emphasizes ancestry, ancestor veneration, reincarnation, and honoring the spirit of nature. Everything else is a construct and if they could do it in 500 BC, of course they can do it right now. Of course they can do it right now. Get away from the alt-right if you actually care about cultural preservation. Get away from the alt-right in the strongest of terms. These people are creating a thought bubble designed for manipulation and mind control. There's no other way to say it. That's what's happening. We find the truth when we go back to